uh, you need to be a student of mm-hmm. your craft and it should never end because new things come out, new technologies since camera gear and editing softwares are very technology driven. You're consistently going to get access to new applications yeah. uh, for, for this craft. <laughs> All right, guys, welcome to another edition of the Skiff Wanderer podcast. Today, I'm joined by a good friend of mine, Mr. Alex Blackwell. What's up, guys? And uh, we've been sitting here in Texas doing a little fishing. Not this morning. We no. were we were supposed to get out. We got up, got early, got tacos made. We were on the road, got to the gas station, filling up, and uh, started drizzling. Decided, let's double check the radar real quick, and said, you know what? We might be doing noon patrol today. Yeah, it's definitely one of those days where weather, the argu- arguably one of the worst variables that we have to deal with as oh anglers came into play. And uh, now we have an opportunity to go ahead and create a different form of content. Yeah, sit down and talk a little bit, talk a little bit about fly fishing, talk a little bit about filming and a little bit about that kind of what goes on behind the scenes that a lot of you guys see the finished product and you don't really get a chance to I, I think hear from the guys that are making the films a lot so I'm, I'm excited to get into that with you a little bit yeah when uh let's start off though when when do you start fly fishing yeah uh so i kind of picked up fly fishing back in i would call it 2008 okay i'm a 94 baby yeah. um so it's one of those things where I picked it up really late. <laughs> You're just giggling over there. <laughs> no, because I, I didn't pick it up till. Well, let's see. I started in high school, took a little bit of a break, and didn't really get get into it as serious as I am now until about two or three years ago. Yeah, uh, me getting serious into fly fishing probably happened the first time I got a chance to go out of the country for fly fishing, which yeah. was Belize. Uh, after I kind of graduated high school and, uh, my dad had some connections within the outdoor industry and he was like, Hey man, listen, like, what do you want to do? Do you want to go to Alaska? Do you want to go to Belize? Do you want to go to Chile? I've been lucky. I've been blessed in that regard. And, uh, I got a chance to go down to El Pescador and yeah. chase after bonefish permit tarpon on fly at this time i still i still did not know how to double haul and (laughs) it was piss poor to look at my cast and just be like uh yeah just like that that grungy grunt (laughs) and the the guide's probably sitting there going what is this kid doing yeah i i don't know some of the the terms that might have been said about this gringo that was uh throw in a 20 foot cast and slapping the fly on top of the water. Actually, funny enough, I, I got taught there how to double haul by one of their instructors who was this, um, who was this female, I forget her name. I mean, it's been so long. High school is a blur to me. And, uh, yeah, I kind of picked it up once she showed me the mechanics and then mm-hmm. all of a sudden it was like, oh, I can throw 60 foot pretty easily. Yeah. Yeah, man. Shit. I'll do it. It's definitely like, <laughs> let what? me ask you this real quickly swearing on the skiff wander podcast i know you're a pirate yeah and you also love cheeseburgers in paradise um adam adam <laughs> play the margarita sound yeah, or the right. margaritaville um I, I, where, where would you like me to stop <laughs> in terms of swearing because i am a i am a sailor at heart i guess yeah. i would say no it's not overboard not overboard. Yeah. All right. I'll keep my f bombs to yeah. a to a minimum, or at least I'll try my best. It's funny because like it, like if you sit here and talk to me, like I do not hold back, and I've done a think a pretty good job of in anything that I'm producing, like holding back. But it's definitely like you know trying to. It's a bad habit, right? Oh, I've listened to a few podcasts where it's like every other word, and it's like, man, I don't want to listen to this. Yeah, there's something that is not wholesome and that's not the right word but authentic and then also uh just easy to listen to when someone takes the time to be very 
specific with their word choice yeah. and not try and add in adjectives like an f bomb <laughs> to portray that emotion. Um, and I think that a platform or at least a a channel like podcasts, if you just take the time and you really think about what you're talking about, it ends up coming together a little bit more cohesively, a little bit more professional. And I can yeah. understand as you're coming on into this, Alex, don't just start talking to me like you talk to me on the skiff, man. Yeah, yeah definitely the language changes when you get the cameras rolling. Oh, a hundred percent. It's a uh, it's a it's a change of pace. But to bring it back to your original question, right? I started fly fishing in this little tiny pond um, that was maybe five minutes away from uh, my house in Connecticut, and it was all four weight, five weight little bass poppers, catching panfish on fly. And that's how I really started to develop as a fly angler. It was not until I was, you know, 18, 19, until I got my first taste of saltwater fly fishing. And that's where I think I went full in, dive headfirst into this blue ocean yeah. of a sport that, truthfully, there is a massive gap. I don't know if you see it, between the fresh and the salt scene, you know, freshwater is super technical. It's very, very technical. And um, I have the utmost respect for, you know, trout anglers. But as soon as you get into the salt, it's it's a completely different world. And that changeover from how do I read a stream? What run should I, you know, um, drift? Uh, hiking back into little pockets, compare that to hey, we're going to drift a flat, and as soon as something comes into view, shoot. Yeah, definitely from what I've seen, like saltwater is a lot faster pace. Mm -hmm. The fish, a lot of times, they spook real easy, so you've got yeah. seconds. I mean, that as soon as you see that fish, you've got seconds before yeah. he's out of your life forever. And I absolutely love that aspect the reason why I'm so drawn to saltwater fly fishing over freshwater, and I still do it. I Hell like throwing yeah. big streamers for trout. If I can come tight on a you know 25 inch brown with you know hucking meat, I'm gonna do it. Yeah, it's bad to the bone. And then on top of it too, throwing big streamers for musky pike, uh, throwing big poppers for bass, uh, and then also. I, I actually have some fun, you know, throwing around nymph rigs and dry flies for sipping trout and, you know, throwing uh, dry dry hoppers. And I enjoy it. I enjoy the whole aspect of fly fishing in every little niche. But when it comes down to it, put me on a skiff yeah. and let me shoot my shot at whatever is crawling or just laid up. Yeah. That gets me going. Every freaking morning, I could, I could wake up and do this. Granted, this morning I was a I was a little tired. Yeah, I, I might have been editing a little bit too much <laughs> last night. And uh, Pete sent me a little text. He's like, "Hey, you moving? You didn't? You almost got the uh, the full Pete's hunting and fishing lodge wake up, which is Dory getting stuck in the room with you, and then there's no way you cannot wake up. That would be savagery. Yeah, but also kind of it's, cute. Yeah, it's one of those like. Oh, I don't want to get up, but there's a puppy. Yeah. Yeah. And Dory's a beautiful, beautiful dog. Yeah. You, you got yourself a absolute gem of a dog. She's rambunctious as hell and oh basically goodness. ADHD <laughs> up to the top teenth point. There's but... a reason we named her Dory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She, her attention span's a little, uh, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a little off, <laughs> but okay. So one of the things, one of the things that, uh, you mentioned already, like okay. you, you fly fish Belize, like you've had a chance through your career to fly fish in a lot of places. What are some of the yeah. places that you've been? So I have fly fished a lot of unique places. Uh, I've gotten a chance over the last couple of years to go to Sudan, Australia, and a lot of different states over, you know, the con US. I, I, I still, I still want to get out to, you know, Chile and do some of the, the rainbow trout there. I really want to get into Bolivia 
Mm -hmm. for the peacocks and also you get your golden dorado and your paera uh, paera yeah paera arapaimas yeah there's so much left i i i've only touched the surface and i've used to a degree my skill set within videography and storytelling and my imagery to allow me to get to these places right fly fishing in my eyes, is a vehicle to unique destinations and unique places. Yeah. Like coming here on the Texas coast, where we were fishing yesterday, you're only going to find fly anglers there. So your average boater, your average conventional angler is not going to find himself in those locations. So I always saw fly fishing as a vehicle to cool destinations. I needed a vehicle for fly fishing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's, that, that was kind of a, uh, a point in my life where I was just like, I really, really, really want to film. I really, really, really want to be outdoors, but I also want to fish. Yeah. <laughs> and I needed some way to go ahead and do that. And there's many avenues you can go down, you know, having a YouTube channel, uh, having a social media presence where you start getting sponsors from brands. And I just gravitated towards the video side of things. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, you know, Sudan. Yeah. That place is cool. You yeah. Know, catching trigger fish on fly on a little atoll that, you know, maybe there's been a dozen or two dozen fly anglers to, and then going ahead and catching GTs and like yellow lipped emperor snappers on an atoll that, from what we were told, was, hey, you guys are the first fly anglers here. Have fun. Yeah. No, I mean, that would be like the dream is, you know, load the skiff up on the back of a, 100 200 foot little osv and just start cruising around the ocean looking for random flats that no one's ever been to yeah there's just costs a lot of money it does cost a lot of money there's there's some last frontiers out there yeah for sure unfortunately the wall the world is getting much much smaller and it is rapidly decreasing yeah. in terms of you know, what's left to touch. Yeah. And so that Sudan trip was actually a 12 day on the water, 14 day exploratory trip. First, first of its kind, I I put out a video about it. I put it up on Vimeo, didn't really publish it on YouTube or anything like that, but I kind of let my followers kind of see it. And yeah, it was an exploratory trip, first of its kind into the Southern portion of the Red Sea. And I can tell you that what we saw really changed my perspective on things and also enth- like it enthralled me to get out there and explore more. Yeah. No, I mean, it's definitely like you hear about places like that. Like I've heard stories about Cuba where they're, they're finding like Cubera snapper up on the flats and it's like, man, yeah. like what, like, I would love to see a lot of that stuff come back to the States where, where we took <laughs> care of everything well enough that you could see a lot of that untouched landscape come back to where, you know, you're going out and you're fishing the flats around the keys and yeah. there's snapper right next to bonefish and tarpon and stuff. Granted, like Biscayne, for example, yeah. they get mutton snapper on the flats. Granted, they're not huge, yeah. but you know, there are little hidden gems where you can find cool stuff like that. But you go ahead and you start talking about a place like Cuba, yeah. which it's not massively publicized about how good the fishing can be there. Yeah. I mean, I did a little bit of research. So when I worked for my previous boss, mm-hmm. John B., um, who's a YouTuber and uh, he likes to be a world traveler. Yeah. Yeah. That That's... That was my vehicle to getting to some of these locations and being placed in those positions to potentially fly fish, potentially film, and create cool stories. We discussed a potential Cuba trip. Yeah. And I went to bat for it. Yeah, of and, course. And we found some funding. We, we we got some sponsors to be like, yeah, if you guys want to go to Cuba, like go on down. And granted, like this isn't all fly fishing at this point. Um John's more of a bass angler. That's his pride and joy. If I try and get a fly rod in his hands, he kind of looks at me funny. It's it's one of those situations where he likes it, but he also doesn't take the time to go ahead and really dial in at that craft because eh, 
it, it takes a minute. It takes a yeah. minute, and I don't. You you might be able to speak on this, but you kind of have to totally deep dive into the fly game and fully immerse yourself, not kind of half assing it, so to say. No, definitely. Like when when I got my start, I was in the backyard every day for at least. 15 minute like little 15 minute chunks every few hours yeah. with and i used i used a lot when i was when i was really trying to dial in casting and double hauling i was using a four weight a lot just because <laughs> it's not as strenuous on your body so you so you don't one of the things that i've that i've seen is if you take an eight weight and you've never thrown a fly rod and you start practicing what's going to happen is the weight of that rod is going to cause you to kind of form some bad habits because you're yeah. compensating for the weight. So like, I'll tell people like, get a small rod, learn to cast on that. Yeah. And then I was going every night out onto the flats where I could just practice with the eight weight. Nice. And, and I remember like some of the first trips when I was really getting into it, like thinking about bringing spinning tackles, like, no, if you're going to like, you need to focus. And, and that's what I, like, I would tell anybody, like, if you want to get into this fly game, it's going to take a lot of practice and it's going to take time and you need to fully commit. If you're going to go out with spinning tackle, as soon as it gets hard, you're, you've brought a crutch along to kind of limit yourself and like, Oh, well it's getting hard. Let me get the spinning rod out. And I think I've got a couple of videos where like I'm solo fishing and I break out a spinning rod. Cause it's like, I couldn't, <laughs> the, boat's <laughs> couldn't moving, the boat's moving so fast that it's like, I don't have, to, like, I don't have the cast down just to, to get it. And now like, God, I don't even know the last time I picked up a spinning rod. <laughs> Honestly, I'm a little bit of a half a. Yeah. Like, I love fly fishing. And so this kind of ties back to what I was talking about. Um, there's a lot in, I would say, the collective industry and also the the mindset of most anglers that you got to be one or the other. Yeah. I like the aspect that I can do both because yeah. it is fun so fun to go ahead and sight cast on the fly rod yeah and then as well as on spinning yeah there's 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 the same gratification that you get out of both and so i am definitely more on the fly side of things currently yeah. with what i'm doing but if i'm just gonna go out you know my parents got a place down in sarasota and i like to go down to charlotte harbor and fish in some back bays yeah, I'm, I'll bring the fly rod, but like I also know, like, hey, like I kind of want to just catch some fish. Yeah. I'll bring the spinning rod. But when I go ahead and link up with a guy like yourself or head up to Massachusetts and link up with a couple of buddies, Idaho, Louisiana, North Carolina, yeah, for right now, it's, it's all fly. And honestly, those locations are fly friendly to yeah. a degree. I think that's the best way to put it. Mm -hmm. I, I had a little questioning kind of additive tone there um but yeah I, i'm a little bit more of a half a and that's something that's very unique I, I wouldn't i wouldn't call it unique but it's it's different from the standard mindset that most anglers have and i would love to see more guys kind of blend the two together and granted right when you're down here in texas i don't think there's a better way to approach what you do from yeah. a skinny water sight casting fish method than fly. Yeah. But if you want to go and bang some trout. Yeah. I, I, if, you, if you're going to take a fly rod out here to go catch trout, like you're going to be working hard. There's a, there's a purpose and a reason to everything we do in life in all aspects. Knowing that, hey, I just want a trout day. Go ahead, bring the spin yeah. rod, have some fun. And it, it, it's it's satisfying because you go ahead, you catch, you know, 15, 20, maybe you catch 50 trout in a day. Then you pick up the fly rod and you're like, shoot. Oh no, when I <laughs> when I put when I put my wife on the boat with me, like they're spinning tackle, I throw her up on the bow, I give her a spinning rod, and just because it, you know, she's still learning the fly rod, so it gives her, you know, a chance to actually have a shot at catching fish. Yeah. And I mean, I, I can already tell you, like when, when we start having kids and I start getting them into fly, into fishing, like I'm going back to bait, like with the kids, like you got to uh, start off with yeah, that. Yeah. Cause you got to make it fun for them. And, and if you're like, if you're new to fishing, like I a hundred percent would be like, don't pick up a fly rod first, 
pick up, you know, <laughs> bait fish, just get used to catching fish. Then, you know, start sight, maybe start sight casting with spinning gear just to get used to sight casting and then slowly bring in the fly rod. Yeah. Because it, I mean, you're out there to have fun. No. And I think that that's one of the things that I've seen is like, you see like a lot of guys that are like, this is serious. We're not messing around. It's like, man, you're fishing. Like you're out there, you're fishing. Like, don't forget, like you're, this is a fun activity that people like, like some like us, like we get to do it yeah. every single day. But like at the end of the day, man, you're, you're going out there to have fun and whatever it takes to have fun, you know, as long as you're also being conservation, I think you should be conservation minded yes. no matter what you're doing, but you should be having fun. My favorite quote of all time. The tug is the drug. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and that and that's the mentality that I keep when I am looking to go out and yeah. you know, fish. Uh, it, each vehicle to the fish and that experience and the place that it puts you. Yeah, dude, it's just the tug is the drug. Yeah. Like that's that's where that half of mentality really stems from. I like to catch fish. I like to see pretty fish. They're real pretty. I like. I like even, even black drum. A lot of people call them big uglies, but oh, man. I love catching. I mean, if, yeah, I love black drum. <laughs> like, don't discriminate. No, uh, I, I, you know, I, I, my where I live from a social standpoint, and then what my previous job was, I lived on social and YouTube all the time, and from there, I got to see a lot of you know different viewpoints and. A lot of people were like, oh, you're catching small fish, blah, 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 blah. It's like, no, I appreciate those. Dinks for days. Dinks for days, right? Like Pete caught a nice little like 17-inch redfish. Loved it. Yesterday. Ew, excuse me. Yeah, you caught a nice little 16, 17-inch redfish, sight casted them. That's not a huge fish. No. It's not a tournament fish, but the tug's the drug. Oh, and that <laughs> fish too. I mean, like he attacked the fly and then basically... I mean, tiny. I mean, yeah, seventeen inch fish. Tacked the fly and put me on the spool. I mean, just took off running. Anywhere you go, redfish are going to pull, and they're oh, going to yeah. pull hard. And it doesn't matter how big they are or how small they are, they're going to pull. And that's one of the things that really opened up my eyes to the inshore game. Right? I to kind of give you a better idea of my backstory. I lived in Florida until I was about ten years old. Mm-hmm. And I had never done any saltwater fishing whatsoever. It was all golf course, bass ponds, using a stick bait, a Sanko, a, a big 10-inch worm. And I, I'd catch some bass, and it was cool. And, you know, my, my dad helped me kind of you know, reel some stuff on up here and there. So I, I never really got introduced to the saltwater scene until I was like maybe a freshman or sophomore in high school. Yeah. And that probably changed my life. I, I think that the first saltwater experience I had with redfish, snook, tarpon, just ruined me. Yeah. <laughs> it ruined my bank account. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> it, 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 it yeah. ruined my mentality on, oh, like, let me go catch a three-pound bass. I'm not saying I discriminate, but at the same time, too, I'd much rather go catch a three-pound redfish than a three-pound bass, and that's because they just pull harder, and yeah. you find them in some of the most pristine and unreal places. I, 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 I've I fallen in love full head over heels to the inshore game, and mm. yeah, man, it's uh, when, you, when you get a chance to come down, fish with Pete, get to see his neck of the woods it's so intriguing to look at the United States or even the, just the Gulf coast as a whole and how much it just changes. Oh yeah. Like I'm, I live in Florida. I lived in Florida till I was 10, moved to Connecticut till I was about 20, 21. I was up in New Hampshire going to school, trying to be a meteorologist cause I love weather, even though it can, it can ruin, uh, ruin some, some fishing days. But then I moved right back down to Florida because I had started to do some inshore fishing and yeah. that again, changed my life, ruined me. And I truly don't believe that I'll ever not be in Florida for long periods of time. But essentially, man, I've lost. Oh yeah. No, now I know where, where I was going. The entire Gulf coast changes massively 
And one of the things that I've noticed about your waterway is that there is a immense amount of seagrass, yep. lush, green, and a ridiculous amount of bait fish. Too much, too much mullet. Too much mullet, honestly. <laughs> uh, th- th- those things are assholes, honestly. But you know, you look at places that have my heart, Charlotte Harbor, and seagrass is absolutely devastated. You look at the red tide events that are going on in that Tampa, St. Pete, even Fort Myers area, yeah. and it is truly devastating. I've seen the red fishery in my neck of the woods drastically change in even the last 10 years of me being around it. And I talk to guides all the time about what it was like 20, 30 years ago when they were, you know, just starting off. And I got a cool little subsection of a story here. Charlotte Harbor, which is a place that is near and dear to me, as you guys can tell, uh, there's a guy there. His name's Captain Rhett Morris. Ridiculously bad to the bone individual. He gets after it. He was telling me a story about how about 20, 30 years ago, when he was just starting to guide, he used to wade out onto the flats. Didn't have a boat at the time. Just would wade out onto the flats. And it would be about like a two-mile hike on dirt pathways to a flat. And he would find schooling bonefish this is this is north yeah, of yeah. fort myers yeah. this is north of sanibel tucked back in so on the east in the east wall yeah. of charlotte harbor he used to find schooling bonefish schooling permit and ridiculous amounts of redfish snook and uh, tarpon yeah and he's like that all disappeared 20 years ago, you know, started 30, disappeared yeah. 20. And after the last 10 years, he's like, our redfish population has become dismal. The snook population is solid, not great. Mm-hmm. And the fishery has just kind of taken a massive step back due to the negligence of certain individuals. Um, and one of the biggest ones is mosaic uh, that that got brought up with the Tampa Bay dumping of uh, Piney Point. Yeah, mosaic was a part of that because they dumped a ridiculous amount of sewage into Tampa Bay, caused a massive red tide bloom, and also another uh, microbacteria or microalgae that literally suffocated the water and killed football fields worth of fish, and. The Peace River that runs into Charlotte Harbor, there is a phosphate mine from Mosaic that's up in the northern section of the Peace River. And they dump those nutrients and, you know, the toxic... Whatever they're not using. Yeah, whatever they're not using into the Peace, and it filters on down into Charlotte Harbor. And that fishery, you know, from, from my conversations with guides, used to be as good, if not better, than like Biscayne Bay, Florida Bay. And unfortunately, it's just taken a hit. And because it's also in a unique area, it's not Tampa, it's yeah. not Miami, it's not Fort Myers. It's you've you've got you got uh, Punta Gorda and Cape Coral from the top to the bottom, maybe Placida over off to closer to the coast. They're not big cities, so that area just kind of loses the attention. And so when you guys hear about these huge red tide blooms in Florida, you'll hear about Fort Myers, Sanibel. You'll hear about Naples. You'll hear about Tampa and St. Pete, but you just won't hear about Charlotte Harbor. So it, it hurts my heart to know that that fishery is consistently taking left hook after left hook after right jab from unfortunately the negligence of individuals however this is the contrast coming over here to texas Mm -hmm. there is lush seagrass everywhere and i i I was i was already mentioning there's a ton of bait there's a ton of mullet too many mullet Too mullet. (laughs) too many mullet when i look at this waterway and i see what you have I come back to my buddies over in Florida and I'm like, listen, I've never seen this much seagrass in my entire life. The only other place that I can think of is maybe Belize. Yeah. It's refreshing to see what happens when humans leave a place to a degree untouched. Yeah. Because obviously 
in your area, right? You got some pretty big cities, I would yeah. call it, you know, Corpus area. It's it looks like I, I had this conversation with you in the car the other day. It looks like what the East Coast of Florida looked like maybe about thirty years ago, maybe forty years ago, where you had some development, right? Yeah. All this development's new age, but uh, you had some development, but there was a lot of areas where it's just like it's open. You you know you go over the sand dunes, you're right on the beach, and there's nothing for days. It's not like you have high rises left and right. Florida has a ridiculous amount of problems. There are still some untouched gems that hopefully yeah. one day I can put you on that I've been able to experience over the last couple of weeks and into the months um, of prior, and it's it's I'm struggling to find them um, more and more around the United States, but most, oh, most yeah. people don't post it on social, you know, yeah. and that's, that's, that's kind of what this new age group of, you know, maybe our generation, maybe yeah. that next generation are looking for is you're always looking for landmarks. You're always looking for, Oh, where yeah, did he tag? Of, yeah, it? There's a lot of people that'll, that, that try to pick out stuff. And I mean, it's, it's, from a content creator side, it's it's one of the things that I know plays in the back of my mind and, yeah. and of, you know, get low shots, make sure you're using like a, a lower aperture so that it blurs out a lot of the background. Spot burning is a problem and a half in our current generation slash society yeah. where, we, where we stand in this modern age. And it's something that I used to be very cognizant of when I filmed with John. It was, you know, hey... Where are we fishing today? We're in West Texas. Yeah. All right. What lake are you fishing at in the comments? No response. No, I, and I'll get that every now and then. Oh, are you fishing here? And it's like, I, I'm going to ignore you. We, as content creators, have to do... We have to service our consumers to yeah. a degree. And I think there is a threshold of... Hey, everybody come to this location and fish this spot because I took a photo and you could see landmarks. You could see, um, you tagged it appropriately yeah. and you, you unfortunately see areas get absolutely massacred by anglers because everybody and their friend, everybody and their mother, everybody and their, uh, entire family is going to come run to that location because it's so good or it's so untouched. And unfortunately, I think that's the problem with Florida is yeah. that, you know, it was, it was highly publicized that, yo, this place is a magical place. And then you start to get the high rises and the buildings and whatnot. So in this new age, we definitely have to do the ecosystem a service by yeah. being cognizant of not spot burning, being cognizant of, maybe shooting at a lower aperture and so that you, everything's kind of blurred out and you know, you, you just tag, I, I, I've made sure in the past to just tag where I shoot my photos, the state that I'm in. Yeah. And that's, yeah, I've started doing that too, where it's like, you know what state I'm in. Um, you can probably figure out what boat ramp I'm using, but like, I won't even film, like if I'm filming the boat running, like I won't film it when I, anywhere near where I'm going to be fishing. Like most of like the running yeah. shots that I try to shoot of the boat are in and around like where the boat ramp is. So, you know, you might see the boat running for a little bit and be like, Oh, all right, he's running down this channel. And it's like, yeah, but I also then might've run, you know, maybe another 10 minutes, maybe another hour. And it's just, you I never don't know. No. And, and it's, it, but it is, it's like, there's a balance in there, I think. And we've talked about it a little bit where, mm -hmm a lot of these areas that that we fish that we get a chance to fish like you want to bring attention to them because you don't want them to go forgotten where bigger corporations can kind of step in and take advantage of the of the resource to their own personal gain very true you know like we talked about bristol bay where i've never fished up there you've never fished up there but like we all know what's going on up there. And I yeah. think the, the guides and the, the content creators that have been up there have done a wonderful job of, of making sure everybody knows what's up there, how awesome it is and that it needs to be protected. And I think the guys that are fishing the Everglades are starting to do a fantastic job of, you know, what's out here, what's going on, what needs to be protected. 
And I think it plays into like the next part of like, if you're into content creation, like make sure you're, you're teaching the right way. Make sure you're showing the right way. You're not burning shorelines. You're not, you know, I'll tell you right now, if you ever see like me running through a Creek, I can tell you I've pulled that Creek. I know where the boat needs to be. So I'm not destroying the, I'm not destroying anything. Um, you know, if you don't need, if don't run across flats, like just there's <laughs> like common sense stuff. Right? Yeah. Like, <sighs> like then there's stuff where you'll watch guys and they're like, Oh, well that's an awesome shot of this guy running. A creek. Like if you see, like I'll tell you right now, if you see somebody running a Creek and they're in, they're in like South Carolina, you know, that's four foot of water. Yeah. Especially if it's high tide, you, you might have eight foot of water in that Creek. That same Creek in Texas is going to have a foot of water. And you should not be running it's it. so skinny in Texas. So skinny. It's incredible how skinny it is. We take some long poles. Yeah, we took a nice little long pole <laughs> yesterday. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll kind of wrap this little seg- segment up uh, in kind of a brief little statement for us. When it comes down to publishing what we publish, yeah. we're very, very cognizant of the ramifications that our content published on social media, which lives forever, Mm -hmm. unless you decide to take it off. We understand that people can go ahead and utilize that as a tool to find locations. And we're not saying we don't want to educate and show what, you know, a fishing spot, a, a unique state or a unique area has to offer. We want, at least I do, I want more and more people to get outdoors and experience this. It is mind blowing to me that most people will live their entire life without just experiencing one redfish or experiencing one brown trout or one tarpon Mm -hmm. or even a muskie or a pike. When you get a chance to actually hold that fish and just admire it for the brief moment that you have with it it's go, it's going to shape you for the rest of your life because there's that mutual respect between you and the fish yeah. the, the fish at that moment it's um there's many films out there that have spoken incredible words upon that moment i might not be the guy to go ahead and talk about it um you know i'll just be layman's terms but we want people to get out and fish It's why you have the Skiff Wanderer channel. It's why you have this podcast. It's why you produce content. You want to get people outdoors. We also don't want people to go ahead and just blow a spot up. And we're very cognizant of that. And then at the same time, too, we're very, I, I can, I think I can speak for us. We're very conservation focused because we want to see these fisheries continue to grow and flourish. We want, you, you know, your kids, maybe my kids one day to experience these waterways. And every single time I talk to a guy and probably yourself too, it's about the good old days, you know, yeah. when, when fishing was real good. Yeah. No, like my, my like I, I, I want this mentality to come yeah. into like anybody that's in the outdoors. Like I, I really want there to be this mentality of, I want one day to sit down with my kids or my grandkids and be like, you don't know how good you have it now. Back in my day, when I was coming up, we didn't see fish like this. Yeah. And, and I think it's 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 obtainable. It's going to be a lot of work, but I think it's obtainable. And I think one of it is just adopting that mindset of, man, kid, you don't know how good you have it now. Hopefully one day we get to that point. Um, it is a long road ahead of us. Yeah. And we've, I think as a whole, as like humanity, we've done a shit job. Yeah, we've really done a bad job of protecting these waterways, but we're becoming aware. Yeah, and there are great organizations out there, like you discussed with me yesterday, Flatsworthy, mm-hmm. um, Captains for Clean Water, like we talked about, the Bristol Bay Movement. Um, there are organizations out there that are fighting for our waterways, and as a young guy, twenty-seven, and you, thirty-two, you're thirty-two, right? Yeah. Oh man. I know. I'm I'm closing on that gap real quick. (laughs) It's so great to see that they're speaking up and they're fighting for us and they're lobbying for us. Florida is a great example. You got just these great people that are publishing phenomenal content Mm -hmm. that are educating the masses and they're bringing that awareness back. Yeah. Um, But 
Yeah, man. I don't know. Uh, we just got really passionate there. Might as well break on into that next passion of ours if you want. Yeah. Well, I'm going to talk about conservation. Yeah. So I decided to go ahead and just quickly throw up an Instagram live so that any of my viewers can go ahead and watch the back half of this podcast on Skiff Wanderer. Or actually the first part of the Skiff Wander podcast. Once that goes up, then they can see, you know, conservation, yeah. talk about spot burning, talk about how I got started in fly fishing. And now let's kind of get on into the camera side of things. Cause I Definitely. get a lot of questions on Instagram about this. And I can only imagine that you get a lot of questions as well. No, and definitely. So, yeah, we were talking about passions and, and there's, so there's a lot of avenues. I mean, obviously we're very passionate about fishing in general and there's a lot of avenues into making more of a career out of it than, than not. And I think we both adopted the content creation side and specifically, um, you've been doing it for a lot longer than me, the yeah. film side. So when did you really start getting into film and, and photos? So I got into photos and film at an early age. I used to go ahead and say, yeah, I kind of really dialed in my videography skills you know, later in life. But the true origin of it was from a film side, it was, hey, I live up in Connecticut. Let's make a snowboarding edit because yeah. it'd be dope. It'd be so cool. Yeah. So I used to take, I don't know if you remember, there used to be these like little like Kodak uh, handheld like handy cams. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they were about the size of a wallet, you know, tall, a little bit slender. And uh, I used to film with that and I made the worst edits possible on iMovie and they were garbage. But that was kind of like the or um, the coronation of that filming aspect. From there, you know, I used to take my parents' camera, and borrow it, and it wasn't anything fancy. And I would just go ahead and, you know, shoot some stuff. And when I started getting into going down to Florida, and more importantly, when Instagram first came out, and I started to edit on Instagram and create photos, I wanted a better camera than just an iPhone 3GS, you know, <laughs> I didn't want a two megapixel camera. I wanted something that took sharper photos because I wanted to showcase to social yeah. that, you know, hey, like I can take some cool pictures too because people were putting out badass content yeah. online. And so once I kind of went through that process, I took a step back. I really just stopped doing the whole, you know, big camera things. I think it was more so cameras and phones got really, really good really quickly. Yeah. And when I was in college, at that point, I had garnered maybe like 1,500 followers. And it was because I was like editing in Lightroom on my phone or uh, I was editing on like a app on my phone. And people were really liking the content. And it got to the point where people were like, hey, like, you should you should do this. You yeah. should you should take some photos. Then I went ahead and took a darkroom photography class. And at that point I was really intrigued with long exposure. Mm -hmm. And I got into the Milky Way scene. Yeah. You know, astrophotography is still a huge passion of mine and it was the catalyst to this whole life's mission that I now have, which is, you know, video telling stories and capturing moments for individuals to live and see and um and have to hold yeah so did a bunch of astrophotography stuff and i started making some bangers they were they were they were clean man and again like i'm taking astrophotography in florida you know how much light pollution is in florida oh, yeah you guys are lucky here in texas yeah shoot um yeah i used to drive you know two hours two and a half hours out into the middle of florida just north of the everglades and <laughs> uh used to wake up at 2 a.m or not sleep get out to the spot at four in the morning during like march and april when the milky way was just rising and you had the darkest light and i used to snap some pretty kick ass photos and that's when my style changed completely i dove on into cameras i understood photography 101 to a t and then it was like why don't i just press the record button yep. And I think that's where a lot of that transition happens. And my opinion is if you don't start off with photography, 
and you just dive on into video, right? You start to lose the basic mechanics and the original education or the foundational education that is in actually just taking a still, right? Mm -hmm. Movies are motion pictures. Yeah, They are moving images. So you need to appropriately expose and uh, set your shutter speed and your ISO and all of the different variables that go into videography uh, and photography. You need to set that appropriately. Yeah. And I got a unique opportunity a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> not that long ago. <laughs> eh, it's not that long ago, but it feels like ages ago where my photos reached a large portion of people. I think uh, when I was in that motion to go ahead and start the video side of things, mm -hmm. I was at like 2,500 followers yeah you know, i was like shoot i'm a big man <laughs> me go. Yeah, yeah. i'm like i'm a goat over here and then i look on over into the social platform like oh, uh, I, i'd like i'd like i'd like at least five or i would like you know ten thousand followers anyways funny funny thing i i used to produce music and make mashups and remixes yeah um that that was a that was a college thing for me i i, I wanted to be a dj um I, I like I like I like music. I'm an audiophile, like I said, um, but essentially a DJ and resident at a club. He went ahead. You got a little buzzy yeah. fly bumming around. He's doing great. He's doing great. Um, it's Fred. <laughs> it's Fred. I got this unique opportunity where this DJ was like, "Hey, man, listen, like, there's an opening at this club, the Ritz Ebor, mm -hmm. and." You know, would you be interested in being a, like a secondary gun for hire there? And I was like, ah, shoot, you know, how hard can video work be? Yeah. You know, I used to shoot <laughs> snowboarding park edits on my little on my little uh, camera. Ah, I could do this, too. I did not know what I was getting myself into. Yeah, yeah. I had no idea. So I ended up doing like a trial weekend first show which these shows would happen on friday night and saturday night first show was at a basically you'd start at like 10 p.m 11 p.m you know have the opener come on then you have you know your secondary act and then your first act it would go until 3 a.m um first show i went to uh just kind of walked the walk um didn't really shoot had my camera was ready to go ahead and you know press record but i walked around saw what the videographer was doing, the resident videographer. Uh, his name's Terry Beeman. Mm -hmm. uh, he's out in LA right now, and he's shot for really, really big artists. Um, great, great guy. Was a phenomenal mentor to me. He basically showed me the ropes. He was like, hey, get a shot here, get a shot here, get a shot here, get a shot here. You should be good. It's 30 to 45 seconds, maybe a minute long for a recap video. Yeah. Just do it. Whoops. Um, <laughs> I got my weekend. I did two shows. Um, I filmed for Breathe Carolina, which uh, they had a song back in the early 2000s called Blackout. I don't know if you can end up no playing time. that, but if, if you haven't heard it or haven't heard of the actual group and then the song, look up Breathe Carolina Blackout. You're going to be like, oh, those guys. Um, and then a... DJ by the name of What's So Not, who is Australian. <laughs> and what's yeah, What's So Not, he yeah. puts out some jams. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> but I filmed those first two videos and they were trash. However, I learned Premiere in a sit down session with a buddy of mine who owns his own media production mm -hmm. company called Vibrant Aspect Media. And I basically learned Premiere and how to do everything I needed to do in one sit down session and then the next one I kind of did it myself and then it was just you know trial by fire yeah <laughs> um, I got back with those two edits and he was like these are good they're not great and not here's what you need you. yeah they're not fire man <laughs> these aren't bangers um <laughs> bet <laughs> yeah. um kids yeah kids um but he gave me some points and he was a hard critique and so that's something that i do with a lot of my following is i'm a very hard critiquer and it is blunt and it might be coarse but it gets the job done and 
there's no way to sugarcoat a bad edit. You need to hit them with time codes. You need to hit them with transitionary points. And Terry did that for me for the first four videos that I ended up producing. I went on to taking over his position and filmed EDM shows at the Ritz for about two years. And I did about 100 shows. Um, no, I did about 200 shows because it was it was two every weekend. And I would, you know, I phased in some new guys later on. And they're all doing fantastic big things now. It was it was kind of a hub for content creation yeah. or video creators. And I learned how to color grade during that time. I learned how to appropriately uh, transition clips with motion and blur and how to set up a, you know, a short story in a minute format. Yeah. And so after absolutely just beating myself up like I'm not fishing I'm working 90 hours a week um because I worked as a, a retail manager for Buckle and PacSun during that time frame but yeah I worked 90 hours a week I had like no social life I just was like wake up grind go to uh, go to sleep at like 2 a.m wake up again at six and keep going. keep going I killed myself for two years I finally said, enough is enough. I've done this EDM stuff for a while. I'm pretty damn good. Let me go ahead and start doing some freelance stuff. So yeah. I worked for an auto detailing company. I worked for an AC company. And I did a little bit of real estate. Um, nothing too crazy. And I finally said, let me apply this to fishing. Yeah. And holy cow. I mean, I whipped up my first one. And then I started getting some uh, some love from like uh, Yakko. Yakko, yeah, yeah, Yakko Lucas, Jack, Captain Jack Productions, um, Tom Rowland from Saltwater Experience, uh, Avid Gear reached out to me. They're an apparel brand. Skinny Water Culture was like, "Yo, what's up?" Um, I started getting that recognition that I didn't think I would ever get, and it was monumental because it it clicked for me, yeah. and I finally transitioned over to filming fishing content. I put out, you'll love this. I put out four videos in four months mm -hmm. after those four months i then got hired by john b and worked in youtube with him for the last two years and some change and now i'm doing my own thing yeah um for for a startup fly fishing company and yeah um it was an interesting road that i got on into but man alive has it been a freaking fun ride um, those first couple of edits that I ended up putting out, I now see so many issues with them when it comes down to the fishing side of things. But I've fallen in love with the longer form, you know, 10 to 15 minutes, short story, short films, and really trying to capture emotion while also playing the roller coaster with music and uh, ties to action. And I've just fallen in love with this form factor of video. And now it's like, you know, second nature. It's, yeah. it's like double hauling, you know, after, after my little <laughs> time in Belize. Takes a little while and then you get it down. Yeah, yeah. So my road is super unique. It's very different from a lot of individuals. So I would love to hear how you got into the video side of things. And then maybe we can kind of touch upon some editing points and yeah. whatnot. So one of the things that, that I want to point out before I, before I really get into the my, my background is for anybody that's listening that is thinking about getting into any form of content creation, one of the things that hopefully you picked up from Alex's story is the amount of hard work, the amount of long days, the amount of this sucks, go back and do it again. Like this this whole entire, like when you see somebody operating, Alex, at your level, like I think a lot of people don't realize the amount of hours spent messing up, doing it wrong. And I mean, that's like, as I've gotten into filming more and more with Skiff Wanderer, I mean, you've been a huge help in critiquing my stuff. Um, a little hard at times. That one of, <laughs> one of the journeys that I wanted to, to kind of have in Skiff Wanderer was my journey as a filmmaker, mm -hmm. as, as a content producer. And that's why, like, if you look at some of my first stuff, like, it's terrible. We all we started all. off with potato yeah. videos, but but I think I think too along that lines. Like if you're gonna get into it, find guys that are better than you, and take that constructive criticism as constructive criticism, not as you suck, quit. And I think also like 
Detach yeah. emotions. Yeah. I think that's yeah. the biggest thing, right? Yeah. This is an art form, so video is subjective. So you got to rationalize that in your head. And then two, right? Not everyone's going to like your stuff. No. Uh, plain and simple, you're not going to appease everybody. And you need to just take a step back and say, what makes me happy? Yep. While also fine-tuning the craft, right? The craft, the foundational aspect of video, you know, um, the filming tell uh, uh getting the right b-roll shots your a-roll shots that's all just fundamental mm -hmm. when a, where a lot of people kind of fail is when they start to add the emotion in like oh this guy I looked up to or this this guy that I've, I've always seen and i really really like he's telling me my stuff is you know not good He's not he's saying talking to you. Yeah. He's not talking to you, the person. Yeah. He's talking to you, your craft. Get better. Yeah. There's so many tutorials out there. There's so many um, resources that you could go ahead and learn. I learned videography on YouTube. Like, oh, yeah. I, I me too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is not a masterclass on, on how to go to art school and get a degree. This is a masterclass on go on YouTube, access that giant encyclopedia, which is the internet, and just get it done yeah sorry no no i mean it's it's 100 percent like like it that's the other thing that i'll see is, is you'll see guys get into it and they want to make their first video the most perfect epic video that everyone's gonna love they're gonna throw it up on youtube it's gonna have five hundred thousand views within a week and then it doesn't happen and they just quit impossible it and is impossible like, to do that no. with your lack of experience yeah. right to become a master at something you have to do it ten thousand yeah. times yep. i'm only like 400 500 videos deep and that's being like uh that's that's me being maybe like over dramatic maybe yeah. i've produced like 300 videos but i've got a long way to go and mm -hmm. yet there's now gotten to a point where people see oh there's like that's a really good video but that was that's 300 videos deep yeah. Like you're starting off, you've maybe produced 10 and you're like, why isn't my stuff looking the way that yours does? And, you know, that, 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 that's something that maybe we can discuss a little bit yeah. later when we get on into some camera techie stuff. But yeah. again, yeah. how did you get on into this whole filming thing? So I actually, um, as a kid, we had one of those like over the over the shoulder camcorders and I would run around in the woods in my with my friends and like, film us making movies that were just terrible <laughs> and then at the same time too my mom always had a, a dslr well i guess it would have just been not digital back then it was which is old film cameras oh, okay SLR. Yeah. yeah basically an SLR. so like she and she would like i mean those things aren't cheap but she would let me as a kid play around with it and everything and then um i went on a five-week road trip picked up my first DSLR, started taking a bunch of pictures. And I'll be honest, like from there, I kind of stopped. I like, I had a good long break where I didn't like that camera, I think sat on the shelf in various houses for about four years. And I, uh, one day we were watching, we were watching meat eater and kind of dawned on me like, man, I have the time and the ability to go and do all this DIY stuff. Like I should do it. And I, at the time I was also making these like GoPro edits of my work down in, down in Antarctica. And like, you know, they were getting like people that saw them were like, Oh, these are pretty cool. And so when I went on my first, I went on a 18 day DIY over the counter elk hunt in Colorado. And I looked at my buddy I was going with, I was like, I'm going to film it. It's going to be epic ballsy and uh while i was doing it though i started taking some photos with that same that same little camera and got back on the ship and you know it was like how can i make these look better so i started watching a lot of stuff on how to edit photos and you'll love this i actually that first group of photos that i edited i used photoshop yeah. Not even Lightroom. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, didn't even know what Lightroom was. Yeah, the, the <laughs> you can. I I know a, a bunch lot of more people. Difficult. Yeah, I yeah. know a lot of people that utilize Photoshop to edit their photos. Yeah. And um, 
I mean, at the same time, right, all the sliders are the same. Um, yeah. All those adjustments are pretty much the same. Uh, Lightroom is just a little bit cleaner. Yeah. Because Photoshop is very daunting since there's so many tools that you can utilize. Um, but again, right, you weren't Photoshopping. Yeah. No, so I started... Um, I put I put started putting some of those photos up on Instagram and just was getting this feedback of like hey like, well before I even started getting that feedback my mom was like man you you know you take some really good photos you should you should kind of get into this and then my wife was like said the same thing and it's like all right well you're my wife and my mom you're supposed to tell me that stuff <laughs> but I started putting them up on Instagram and they were getting a lot of traction I was like man maybe maybe they're right maybe I should start looking into this more and so I I honestly like. I was living in Florida at the time and I would just take off and go into the WMAs around me and just spend hours hiking and taking photos of whatever I could find. And this just kind of idea of, of, I fell in love with it. I fell in love, back in love with the outdoors. I wanted to be outdoors and I started, I wanted to get into film, but I said, man, before I get into film, I want to master photography or at least have a really good baseline with photography. And so I upgraded my camera to the one I'm using now. I just took a ton of photos and just kept trying to make them better and better and better. And then as I got better and better, I, I wanted to get back into film. And I was trying to figure out, like, how do I want to get into film? What can I do? Because I know, like, I know my film and my films in the beginning aren't going to be great. Yeah. Yeah but I wanted to find a way to still put them out and produce them. And, and that's when, honestly, when the whole skiff wanderer idea started to formulate my mind of, I'm going to have this journey as getting back into the outdoors, as becoming better at fly fishing, as becoming better as a filmmaker. And I can put this on YouTube because it's YouTube and you can put whatever you want on YouTube. And, and it'll just kind of give everybody this, this sense of like, you know, Hey, you don't have to be a master at any of these things to just go do it. And and that's mm. that's where I'm at now is is still trying to master all of those things and yeah, I mean, I think if if you want to get into it, just get into it. Just jump in 2 feet and just realize it's going to be a long road. I mean, I think I started really picking up the camera and that was 4 years ago. Gotcha. And it's but I mean, it's just constantly like learning and I mean, I still jump on and watch YouTube videos about how to make stuff better. Yeah. Uh, you need to be a student of mm -hmm. your craft and it should never end because new things come out, new technologies since camera gear and editing softwares are very technology driven. You're consistently going to get access to new applications yeah. uh, for, for this craft. And yeah, man, um, I am head in like I deep dive massively into the study of this craft every single day every single week every single year I'm always learning and I think that people just believe that you pick up a camera you press record and you splice up the clips and that's it what my one of one of my quotes that I like to say is anybody can film anybody can press yeah. the record button um shoot you don't have to be great you can have wobbly hands to a degree but it takes an artisan and an artist to go ahead and produce in post yeah oh for sure yeah to make everything flow. i mean that was honestly one of the the best parts about getting into film along along with starting a vlog about fishing is it, it taught me it's taught me very quickly how to edit a day of fishing into a story that mm. makes somebody want to watch it because it's easy. I mean, it's easy to go out there and you can get awesome shots of people casting and awesome shots of catching fish and fish releases, but then to like piece it all together of, you know, this happened and this happened and we did this. Like it, it takes a lot of, of messing that up. And looking at what you did and saying, I need more of this footage. I need yeah. to make sure I'm doing this. And honestly, like the vlog thing is immensely like helped me become better at that. Yeah. Cause you're actually performing the act of filming with intent every single time you mm -hmm. hop onto the water. Um, yeah. One of the things that I love about what you do with the rough logs is there is a cinematic aspect to it, but it's also raw. So it's this 
beautiful blend between what you'd expect to see on YouTube yeah. and then also what you don't expect to see on YouTube. And it's something that I tried to do uh, with John when I worked with him. It was how do we tell these stories in a cool, unique, cinematic fashion while also being true to his origin yeah. and what the channel truly was, which was GoPro chesty footage, you know, vlogging, all that other stuff. So I absolutely love, excuse me, what you've done with the rough log. Yeah. It is a rough. great piece of rough, raw, <laughs> cinematic beauty all mixed together to create a 13, 15, 20 minute video that is just about hopping on the boat with some buds, shooting some camera, killing, uh, not killing, I'm sorry. Uh, I was going to say Ca killing some fish. Catching some fish. Catching some fish. Or not. <laughs> or not. It depends. Um, it depends on how hungry Lindsay is. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, you, you've done such a great job with starting from ground level zero mm -hmm. and working your way up. And I think I can speak for you on this where when you do this, you enjoy the process. Oh yeah. And that's something that is a indicator of whether or not you're going to succeed in this mm -hmm. in anything you do in life. If you do not enjoy the process of waking up early just to get some extra B roll shots, staying up late just to finish up that edit, yeah. taking the time with a fish, you know, making sure it's going to be revived, but also grabbing, you know, four or five shots for a different selection so that when you go back and post, you're set up to succeed. Yeah. If you don't love that process, it's not for you. No. It's like, hey, I didn't love the process of school. It's why I bounced and I'm a college dropout, but look at me now. Yeah. I, I, I run around and fish and film and I, I do some cool stuff. And granted, right, I, I have some regrets about that, that whole process and how it went down. But at the same time too, right, I followed my passions. I was... A, a student of the game and I dove into the everlasting process that is filming and videography and content creation and media production. Uh, I, I, I want to learn more, man. Yeah. I, I, I'm at a point in my life where I want to get better at studio shots, mm -hmm. which is oh, something yeah. that, you know, for you, you know, I, I look at him and I'm like, man, I, I would love to know how to do that, but I'm not ready. Yeah. And I, now I'm at the point where I'm lucky enough to be, I'm ready. Like, yeah. let me dive into a studio and let me dial in lighting and make sure that I, I can create some of the best product media that I possibly can. But all at the same time, too, going back to my roots, getting yeah. in the water, sitting crisscross applesauce, shooting some tail and black <laughs> drum you know, on a 400 millimeter lens. Uh, I like that aspect and I don't mind the idea of hopping on into a studio and having two people with me and lighting stuff up and getting the appropriate shots. Uh, this video thing, it's, it's so dense. It's very complicated, but if you want to tell stories and we're in an age now where you can tell stories mm -hmm. and publish it on social, on YouTube, on Facebook, on Vimeo, whatever channel you want. You can do it. You just got to, in, in, in the words of a, a business partner of mine, you just got to nut up or shut up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, I, did, I got a question for you. Um, yeah. With everything that you're doing... Mm. How weird does it feel? Like, how weird does it feel to be out on the water without a camera? Do you even go? Great question. I actually love it. Yeah. I, because my life, my work is centered around holding yeah. a camera at all times, I get very brief moments mm -hmm. where I'm able to set that down yeah. and just immerse myself in hydrotherapy no i've got some i've got some great friends that like i'll i'll have i mean I'm, i don't go on the boat without my camera gear but i'll jump on the boat with them with everything and they look at me like man let's let's just fish and i'm like you know what let's just fish and it's just you get a you get a chance to just kind of just enjoy being out there for the day i mean i'll tell you right now the whole time in the back of my mind i'm like i could get this shot i could yeah. be doing this and but it's at the same time like, you're like man it's just nice to just enjoy it there's 
a point from the for me it's a profession for you yeah i would call this a growing profession yeah um there's a point where you need to take what is a hobby and separate away from profession mm -hmm. granted now i've been if i'm gonna have fun i'm just gonna roll a chesty or i'm gonna roll a head cam i'm gonna get some cool shots and i kind of just forget about it it's already rolling i'm not trying to get uber cinematic i'm not trying to tell a story i'm just trying to capture a moment and just mm -hmm. let it live uh live on video and that's how a lot of these youtubers started out you know i got a good deep dive into uh john and his mentality when starting off he was like i just wanted to go i'm sorry i had a bug fly in my face um he's like i just wanted to go ahead and just relive those moments and for me I, I walk on two lines. It's either I don't have any cameras at all or I'll just bring a GoPro and a chesty. Yeah. But a trip like me coming down here, right? I'm down here for work. <laughs> um, I, I You saw me. I got down, I got down for tacos. At, tacos and work. <laughs> the, the fishing lodge here, Cat and Pete's Fishing and Hunting Lodge, five stars. And that's a quote taken directly from the one and the only Bryant Patterson. Right. If you don't know who he is, just watch some wild fly stuff. You'll uh, you'll see you'll see an interesting Alabama boy running around with a with a nasty double haul <laughs> on a on a trout stream <laughs> on a trout stream. Um, he does like red fishing, but whew, uh, he doesn't get down there enough. No, those boys are hooked. They they're already trying to like. So can we come back? Like, yeah, come on. <laughs> yeah, they're 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 awesome guys. Um, that that whole situation, the whole wild fly and. Uh, short bus diaries that they've gone ahead and just manifested and put on into social is a wonderful example of how you can be successful after years and years and years of creating videos and not seeing any results. Yeah. Um, Scotty had been publishing videos for years um, and they were, they were solid. They were mm -hmm. great. But then he had that one that just fired off. So never give up. Yeah. I, I think that's the biggest thing. Never give up always perfect your craft and as you get better people will start to notice and uh i think the biggest thing in my eyes is what happens on the cutting room floor in post yeah. actually you can you can document a day but piecing that together and putting everything cohesively into however long that film episode rough log needs to be you you've you've gone ahead and created something completely new yeah and you've you've changed the perspective but also you've shaped the path in which the audience walks that's freaking cool yeah it's kind of like playing you know <laughs> god a little bit it's like you're gonna walk down this path and this path watch only this. watch this <laughs> but i think that's that's the whole point of this giant form of art you yeah. know it's you create something and you had a purpose, a reason and a feeling, but people can also look at that and appreciate different little aspects. One of my favorite things that I ever received from a comment standpoint on YouTube when I was filming for John's, it was like, oh, that shot of this fish looked amazing. Oh, this was pieced together like a Netflix series. It's, or or better yet, right? Um, oh, that, that little section of audio just sounded awesome. The sound design was great. It's the little nuances. It's the little details that yeah. I I go the extra mile for, and I do it for myself, and I love that. Yeah. And if someone can appreciate that, be, while walking that path that I yeah. laid out for them, they've noticed that little pebble on the side of the road that was just kind of sprinkled there by me, and it shows that people pay attention. Yeah. And with video. I mean, our attention spans are pretty, pretty <laughs> dismal at the moment in society. It's like 15 seconds and then, ooh, squirrel. Ooh. Um, but if you can have and capture someone's attention for six, seven, eight, ten minutes, and they can appreciate what you've done in that in, in post, it's it. I, I don't think there's anything better out there for me. It's nailing the shot, telling a badass story, having a little bit of appreciation, but also just spending time with good people. Yeah. Um, but yeah, post-production is something that 
a lot of people neglect. Mm -hmm. And I know that you have been working your tail off at getting better. Yeah. And it's about efficiency, but then it's also yeah. that quality as well, right? If you yeah. bump up quality, your efficiency goes down, but you get a better product out of it. So when it comes down to you know publishing as much content as pos possible, you sometimes let quality go and bring in more quantity. Yeah. I am a big advocate for what you do, which is when you sit down, you make a rough log, you are, you're taking a day. Yeah. I'm getting it down. Yeah. I'm getting, you, I'm getting that time frame down. You're but, building up the efficiency and yeah. I'm, I'm really intrigued to see where rough log goes and maybe, just maybe, maybe it's not rough anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no it's definitely like i mean for me like you get like i look forward to those days where i know i'm going to be stuck behind a computer editing because you get to relive a lot of those moments yeah that you had i mean and it's really cool too being behind i mean when you're filming you know you get to see the whole behind the scenes aspect i mean i think the the best example i can think of is yesterday when we were eating lunch we're eating lunch we got the turtle box going we're just hanging out we start Vibing. seeing tails pop up all over the place just jump out of the boat catch a couple of black drum and then alex breaks out the long lens and like i know that every time that i that i see the footage that you capture to those tail and fish like i'm gonna remember just chilling and just you sitting indian style <laughs> on the marsh floor <laughs> chest deep with that long lens just capturing that footage and i think like like i mean you want to talk about like the passion that you have the passion that mm -hmm. bryant has it's it's you know we go out and we capture these shots and then just hang out and just love life and just enjoy it and just it's it's I don't even know how really to describe it because it's just, it's something you just have to see and be a part of and do. Mm -hmm. And it's it like, like I think like you've said, like if you're getting into this, like you have to love doing it and you'll yeah. start as you get into it more and more and you get a chance to work with guys that are into it. You'll see like the passion that they have, the drive that they have that, that you know, we're going to take the time to get the shot and then we're going to take 20 minutes and hang out. Where's the applause button? Cause I kind of want to hit it right now. Thank you, Pete. That was that was brilliantly said. Yeah, and uh, you're dead on, man. This yeah. is a we got one life, man. Mm -hmm. You gotta live it well, as Sims has or fish it well, as Sims fish has duly well. uh, noted and used for marketing materials. Damn you guys, that's a good one. Yeah, Way it's go, it's, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's it's a pretty good one. I I always think to myself, I'm like, shoot, that was a good that was, that yeah. was a good little snippet. Um, that they could use, but yeah, you got to live it well. You got to fish it well. You got to go ahead and, you know, just enjoy the small moments, man. Um, like yesterday is a great example. And I'll also say this, right? We're hanging out, yeah, but we're also working. And I was, <laughs> and I was working, I was working to get those shots, man. I'm trying to stabilize a big old lens and trying to shoot at 1080p 240 and try and just get that saucy tail and footage which was gorgeous i I'm, I'm very pleased with how that stuff came yeah. out but yeah you know sit down good day eating a sandwich playing some tunes and then all of a sudden you're just like i see a tail and i want to go get him <laughs> i want I, I want i want me a black drill i just still can't believe that worked <laughs> oh it worked out perfectly and then you're like hey this is dumb easy like here's a fly rod go and get your one yourself you're gonna get one easy no worries and then i'm you know eight tails deep and then finally one dumb one decides to come play with me um yeah man yesterday was an incredible day it's uh you don't get days like that very often on the fly and uh it was a reminder of why you grind yeah. on the fly but then also why you take the time to capture those moments they are rare they yeah. are very hard to come by and so we spent a lot of time with fish yesterday making sure that they were prepared um, when they wanted to kick off or when we wanted them to kick off, uh, making sure that we got all the shots that at least I wanted to grab. Since yeah. again, this is a content mission for me being down here in Texas. I mean, I love hanging out with you, Pete, but like I, I got, I got to mix pleasure and work together. Uh, that's, that's, that's where uh, the, the Holy Trinity, the trifecta <laughs> meets. Um, and I get to live my best life. Yeah. You know? uh, but you know, you mentioned it yesterday to me, I think in the car ride and you were like, 
the fact that you just take a moment, you step back, you breathe a little bit, and then you get the shots that you need. Pete. Yeah, I know. So, all right, guys. So we had a camera battery go out on us. Uh, Failure. If you're watching this, uh, sorry about the lack of footage there. But uh, we're back, though. I don't think we're going to stick around for very long. The sky's starting to look good. Everything's starting to look better. And we haven't caught a fish today. No, actually, I don't know if you can see this. And you definitely won't see it on the camera. And you won't see it via the podcast. I, I, I put up a photo for you. On my, on my on my phone. Okay. Yeah, you, you see yep. that? Yeah, that, I see that. What is that? What is That's that? That's a redfish. That's a redfish. Let's go get. Let's one. go find a redfish. We had a really good conversation. We talked about conservation. We talked about camera gear. We talked about hey, listen, this is a hard process, but you sh- you can do it. You can go out and do it. We're, we're two doofuses to a degree. I am definitely <laughs> definitely. Um, that I don't know just, what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what we're doing, but you know, we utilized YouTube to figure all in and out. Anyways. Dude, this was this was fun. Yeah, definitely. I'm really intrigued to see how this all came out because it was a hot mess. <laughs> but hey, listen, what, third time's the charm? <laughs> yeah. No, definitely still learning a lot on the podcast side. Um, you guys, I'm going to leave links down below for a lot of stuff we talked about today. And so you guys can go and find more of Alex's work, which you should definitely check out. Mm. And then as always, hit like, hit subscribe, all that other stuff. And I will see you guys soon.